Hello everyone, today we'll be talking about effective circulating volume. One of the things that you would have noticed that when you enter a swimming pool, after some time you feel like going to the bathroom. So this all depends upon how your body is sensing your effective circulating volume. So let's understand this a little better. ECV is the volume that is involved in perfusing the tissues and this is really important because your body will do anything and everything to preserve ECV because ECV is the one which governs your perfusion of the tissues. If your body cannot maintain ECV, you will die. Your effective circulating volume is sensed by arterial baroreceptors present in your aortic bodies, carotid bodies and GG apparatus in kidneys and these sense perfusing pressures, not the volume. So you can call it effective circulating pressure in a way. Remember that your pressures are generated in your arterial side. So the effective circulating volume depends upon your stressed volume. That is the amount of blood that is present in your arterial compartment. Around 70% of the blood is present in your venous side, which is an unstressed compartment and does not contribute to your effective circulating volume. And whenever this volume decreases, your pressure will decrease and this will be sensed by these receptors. Since sodium is the main ion that holds on to the water, regulation of sodium is very important in maintenance of ECV. So your body regulates sodium very well. Your perfusion of organ depend upon ECV. Your ECV will depend upon your plasma volume. To be exact, the volume in the stressed compartment and your systemic resistance and your body will adjust your cardiac output depending on the perfusion to the tissues. So let's understand a few examples before going further. Say for example, you have volume depletion, you have low plasma and ECF volume. This will stimulate your sympathetic stimulation and sodium and water retention pathways. You will have some movement of blood from venous to arterial compartment, increased cardiac output. This will maintain your ECV and maintain your perfusion. If your volume depletion is very advanced and you don't get enough fluid, you will be unable to maintain your ECV and despite maximal increase in cardiac output, you won't be able to maintain your perfusion and you will pass out. In heart failure, the primary problem is your decreased cardiac output, which unfortunately results in movement of fluid to your extravascular space and your body will kick in your sympathetic stimulation and sodium and water retention pathways, trying to maintain your perfusion pressures. However, prolonged sodium and water retention along with sympathetic stimulation on long run can adversely affect your heart and results in symptoms like edema, shortness of breath, pulmonary edema, etc. We'll talk about these other effects in some other lecture. Similarly, in cirrhosis, the movement of fluid to extravascular space occurs because of formation of ascites and hypoalbuminemia, resulting in stimulation of your sodium and water retention pathways and this will increase your sympathetic stimulation, increase cardiac output and your body will try to maintain your perfusion. So whenever you think about ECV, think about the perfusing pressure that these receptors are sensing. And this perfusing pressure will depend upon your ECV, which is your plasma volume in your arteries and cardiac output. So ECV is not same as extracellular fluid volume or plasma volume or cardiac output. It is the amount of blood present in your stressed compartments. So what happens when your ECV falls down? Your carotid and aortic bodies, when they sense low ECV, they stimulate the sympathetic nerve system, which results in venoconstriction and increased cardiac contractility, resulting in increased cardiac output. They also cause arterial vasoconstriction, which maintains your blood pressure. They also stimulate renin angiotensin system, which results in aldosterone production and stimulation of your sodium and water retention pathways. Angiotensin also is a good arterial vasoconstrictor that helps maintaining your blood pressure. Low ECV is sensed by your GZ apparatus and that stimulates your renin angiotensin system primarily and stimulating your aldosterone production resulting in more sodium and water retention pathways. You also inhibit the production of atrial natriuretic peptide which aids in further sodium retention. If your ECV becomes very low, you stimulate your pituitary to form ADH and that results in absorption of free water, which also helps your ECV. However, it results in hyponatremia. In all these cases, your urine sodium will be less than 20. Apart from understanding ECV, you have to understand the distribution of blood volume in your system. 
The blood is evenly distributed in your stressed compartment. However, in unstressed compartment, that's your venous side, the amount of blood is distributed according to gravity and results in venous pooling in the legs. If you remember from my anatomy lectures, the flow of blood from vein to the heart is more complicated and usually involves muscular activities, vena comitans, and valves. In standing position, pressure of blood in your vein is pretty high, resulting in venous pooling of legs. This is the reason why you develop pedal edema, venous stasis, varicose veins, etc. in the legs. Sitting or standing for a prolonged period of time will result in swelling of feet even in a normal person because you are not using the muscular pump of your legs to push the blood towards the heart. This will result in swelling of the legs and stasis can sometimes result in deep venous thrombosis. So what happens when you immerse in the water? You sense hydrostatic pressures and these hydrostatic pressure will be equal to the weight of the water column and they will neutralize each other and this will result in redistribution of the venous blood which will be more uniform. So instead of pooling in the legs, the more of the blood is shifted to the arterial compartment and that will be sensed as increased ECV. Once you have elevated ECV, your carotid and aortic body will inhibit the sympathetic nervous system. Once your sympathetic system is inhibited, you get venodilation, decreased cardiac contractility and arterial vasodilation. This results in lower heart rate and lower blood pressure. You also stimulate your arterial natriatric peptide, result in renal salt wasting. Elevated ECV will inhibit your renin angiotensin and aldosterone system, resulting in renal salt wasting. You'll also have increased GFR and pressure natriuresis, and all these processes will result in salt and water loss. Apart from the hydrostatic pressure, temperature of the water has its effect as well. If you are immersed in cold water, instead of inhibition of sympathetic system, you will have stimulation of sympathetic nervous system, and that will result in venoconstriction, increased cardiac contractility, and arterial vasoconstriction. And this will stimulate your renin angiotensin system, and that will result in more renal salt wasting. When they studied humans immersed in water, you can see that their heart rate and blood pressure is higher when they are immersed in cold water. They have increased diuresis in cold water as compared to warmer waters, and they have higher levels of epinephrine and noradrenaline in the system. As we discussed in our flowchart before, you have decreased plasma renin activity and plasma aldosterone with immersion, you have increased urine sodium losses, and you have elevated atrial natriuretic peptide. So whenever you immerse somebody in water, you have increased sodium and increased water losses. Immersion in cold water also increases your urinary sensation and frequency due to cold exposure. So you make more urine and you have more sensation to pee. Once you come out of the pool, all these changes reverse and you may actually feel dizzy since you are now volume depleted and coming out of water means that your blood starts pooling in your leg again. You will also feel very thirsty and you would like to drink water along with the salt to replenish your lost sodium and water. Immersion in the water can be therapeutic as well, especially in your heart failure and cirrhotic patient. If they spend an hour or more in water, they will diarrhea quite well. This also explains the fact that if you lay your heart failure patient supine, he will diarrhea more. This is also the reason why these patients have nocturia. And did you know that the smell of the chlorine from the swimming pool is not exactly from the chlorine, but from chloramines? When chlorine is added to the water, it makes hypochlorous acid, which acts as your antibacterial agent. However, this can react with ammonia to form chloramines, and depending on the amount of ammonia, you can have mono, di, or trichloramine. And since these are heavy molecules, they tend to stay low and near the pools for a longer period of time compared to water vapor. And this ammonia comes from urine. So you will see the smell more commonly if children are using the pool. That smell will be also more common in public pools and those pools who do not have adequate ventilation. So to summarize, your body will do anything and everything to preserve the effective circulating volume. Understanding effective circulating volume is very important in taking care of your patient who are hypotensive. Your goal is to maintain the effective circulating volume so that tissue perfusion does not suffer. If you cannot maintain your effective circulating volume, 
patient would most likely have poor outcomes.